this is a special edition of Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the premier financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Now, for this special edition of Macro Voices, here's hedge fund manager Eric Townsend. Macro Voices Hot Topics, Episode 13, was recorded on April 5th, 2020. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode of Macro Voices is dedicated to the true heroes of the COVID-19 crisis, healthcare workers around the world. Please join us in supporting them. This episode was made possible by the generous donations of listeners like yourself. Joining me today is Jeffrey Christian, founder of CPM Group, and we're going to do a special episode on the gold market and some of the mechanics of the gold market. In a recent Macro Voices podcast, we had quite a bit of feedback from my comments in the market wrap, and we want to go deep on the subject of the physical gold market, how it works, and what investors need to know about it. Jeff, thanks so much for joining us. I want to start with the big picture. I've got my long list of reasons that I am extremely bullish gold in the long term. Precious metals generally, silver as well, uh, I've said are going to be the assets to own in the 2020s. But you're a guy who has a reputation for, despite being in this industry, being quite willing to sometimes take a bearish view. So let's start with the high level. Uh, Are you bullish gold? And if so, what are your reasons for being bullish gold? Yeah, we are bullish gold in the long run. We have been saying that we thought gold prices would move to record levels in the 2020s. We're not looking for $10,000 because I don't think that that's a rational view, but we are looking for prices well over $2,000 on an annual average basis. And understand when the price reached $1,900 in 2011 and then in 2012, the the annual average price was peaked at $1,670. So we're looking for substantially higher prices. And the reason we're looking for substantially higher prices I guess it, it, it's a waterfall of several reasons. The, the primary reason is that we think that the economic and the financial market and the political environment, the factors that feed investment demand for physical gold, will be extremely hostile, continuing to be extremely hostile, and be, will be more hostile than they were in 2008, 2009, 2010, and 11, when the gold price rose sharply. And so we think that you have a very hostile economic and political environment, which will fuel investors to return back to gold and silver. Now, that may be a surprising and loaded statement that we come back to, but the reality is that investors have bought less physical gold in 2018 and 2019 than they had in any year prior to 2002. And investment demand for silver, for physical silver, also has been at extremely low levels, the lowest level since like 2005 in the last couple of years. So our expectation is you have an economic environment which causes investors to return as large scale buyers of physical metal. And the physical market is actually relatively tight in terms of a new supply of a a supply of newly refined metal coming into the market relative to fabrication and investment demand. And so given the tight market and given the fact that you've seen the prices rise last July and August, even in the absence of investment demand for physical metal, that suggests to us that when investors start buying more physical metal again, and they have started buying as of March of this year, the price of gold and the price of silver are probably going to rise sharply. And we have we have gold prices rising to record levels. We have silver prices rising extremely sharply, but possibly not to record levels, topping their 2011 point. Jeff, I'm fascinated by the content of your reply. Obviously, the, the points you make, I agree with. They're excellent. You're talking about various things being wrong and being broken and fear in the markets. I was surprised that you didn't emphasize the monetary policy actions that have happened recently. Uh, A lot of people, myself included, have said, holy cow, if the Fed is going to literally expand its balance sheet at $625 billion a week, that's more money conjured out of thin air in one week, and they're saying they're going to do that every week, then the entire QE2 program, which was $500 billion, 
it seems to me like we're debasing the value of fiat currency generally, and that has to be good for gold. And I, I didn't really hear you emphasize that. Or do you disagree with that view, or do you see it as not being quite as important as some of the other things you mentioned, or, or what? Because that, to me, it kind of stands out as the first thing that comes to my mind. It is the first thing that comes to mind. I mean, ultimately, the debt markets, not just government debt, not just U.S. government debt, but total debt markets, that is probably the first thing in our minds. I was speaking at a very high level per your request, and I said, you know, we're looking at economic and financial market and political factors driving investors into precious metals. And that's a, a catch-all. And our view of monetary accommodation, if you will, or large-scale asset purchase programs, or however you want to call them, that's part of the financial market stability and the economic stability issues that, that we think will drive investors into the metals. So on that level, it's not that I didn't mention it. It's just that I, I put it into that overall category of financial market instability. Now, I think that the debt is extremely problematic. But I also think there are any number of people who overemphasize the issue of the debt. And the debt can be extremely problematic. It could be cataclysmically problematic for global economics and global political stability. However, it doesn't have to be. You can see, as you know, the first time we saw this was in the period 1980 through 1983, when we were in a deep recession and we had a a major financial crisis, and Paul Volcker was the Federal Reserve Board chairman. And in 1981, you had sovereign debt in Eastern Europe starting to collapse, and we had a, a series of reschedulings. And then in the first half of 1982, you had a situation where Latin American debt was going to collapse. And, and I hate to go into the history, but I think it's very important to understand because ever since 1982, central banks around the world have followed the Volcker policy. Volcker had a meeting of central bankers in June, July of 1982 in Washington. He said, this stringency in which we're squeezing inflation out of the economic system has gone on too far and the system is about to break. So they opened the sluices. They poured a tremendous amount of money into the market and got us out of that recession in six months time. Once we got out of that recession, now the gold price, when they had that meeting in Washington, the gold price was like $286 an ounce. By December of 1982, the gold price was $500 an ounce because everybody looked at this monetary flood and said, this has got to be hyperinflationary. And they bought gold and they drove the price to $500. In the first quarter of 1983, we were out of the recession and they turned the screws and they started selling bonds and sucking all that money back out of the system. We never had the hyperinflation that was expected. In fact, inflation went from 14% down to 2%, you know, 3%, 2%, 1%, and has stayed there ever since. That was the Volcker model. And that was followed by Greenspan when he was Fed chairman. And that was the origin of Ben Bernanke's comments about when you get into an economic or financial crisis, you throw money at it. You throw the money out of the helicopter, if that's what you knew. And then you worry about sterilizing the inflationary implications after you're out of the crisis. Now, that's important because what you need to do and what we, they tried to do and failed in 2015, 2016 in the global economy, but you know, led by the U.S. Treasury and Fed, they tried to start to sterilize the potential inflationary consequences of all that largesse. They started unwinding the balance sheet at the Fed. They started sucking almost a trillion dollars out of the Treasury, out, out of U.S. dollars in circulation. And what they found was that the economy was hooked on all of that cash. It never really had an inflationary implication for global you know, consumer price inflation or even uh, producer price inflation, but it did have a hyperinflationary impact on the stock market, which is why the stock market moved steadily higher from 2010 until earlier this year. So I look at the monetary largesse that we've seen in March and we'll see going forward, and it can be problematic but it doesn't have to be. And I think there are a lot of people who have this very simplistic view 
of money creation that look at that and they say, this is going to have to be hyperinflationary and it's going to have to be bad for the dollar. And actually, if you go into the mechanics of A, the debt market and B, the currency markets, it doesn't have to be. I'm not saying that it won't be, but I, 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 I'm saying that it doesn't have to be. If we had intelligent, ethical leaders in, in, in government and central banks, uh, then we could probably manage our way out of this. Regardless of what actually happens, investors around the world are watching this and saying, okay, yeah, the thing about the ethical, intelligent leaders in government, I'm going to buy gold. Well, Jeff, it sounds like we're in violent agreement then. It's almost as if there's uh, too many excellent reasons to be long-term bullish gold. I, I want to talk a little bit about the structure of the market and the participants in the marketplace. I got a whole bunch of flack from uh, comments that I made in a recent Macro Voices podcast, probably because I glossed over an important topic too quickly. So let's really get into this. Now, when I first learned about gold and gold investing about 15 years ago, I was really, really taken by the, the argument that, boy, you know, it seems like governments are going to continue debasing the value of fiat currency. The best hedge that there is against that is precious metals. But the more I learned about it, the more I was just struck by how many conspiracy theories and, and crazy stories seem to be associated with this particular marketplace. And I couldn't figure out why. And it was a gentleman from Canada named Nick Barashev who explained it to me one day. He just said, Eric, it's dirt simple. The only thing in finance that you can do without a license of any kind is physical precious metal sales. And what that means is we have a lot of really great people in the precious metals market, but we also are the the place where everybody who either has a felony conviction or has been caught by regulators doing something wrong, hedge fund shenanigans, whatever, if you get barred from the financial industry for life because you did something illegal, the one thing that you can do to stay in the finance business is to get into physical precious metal sales because no license is required. That's the reason. And what that means is that those guys who can't get a license to sell securities because they have a felony conviction are going to need a reason why it's a bad idea for you to buy your gold through a security like an ETF or a mutual fund or what have you. They need a good reason for you to only want physical metal because that's all that they can legally sell you because of their felony conviction. So they make up all kinds of stories. And I said, oh, that perfectly explains it. I, I get it now. Now, Jeff, you have a very colorful reputation in the industry. Most professionals kind of roll their eyes at these conspiracy theories and don't really take them too seriously. You go out of your way to try to debunk these things and correct the misconceptions. And frankly, from what I've seen of watching your career for the last decade, it only brings grief into your life. You were physically assaulted by an angry gold bug at a conference once because of something that you said, trying to explain how the market really works, trying to debunk some of the, the nonsense that's out there. Why do you do this? And, and what kinds of, I've described you know, Nick's version of why the market is this way. Why do you think the market has maybe more colorful characters in it than most other financial markets have? Wow, there's a whole lot of stuff to react to in, in your comments, which is one of the reasons why I love you. First off, let me clarify something. The only time I've been physically assaulted was by Bill Murphy of GATA, and that was at a conference after I pointed out that he had actually been barred from being a commodities broker by the CFTC, and he didn't like that. But that goes to your point, which is when the SEC and the CFTC don't allow you to to get involved in futures or options or, or, or stocks or bonds, you get into physical metal. Another point that I would clarify that's not exactly true is I don't actually go out of my way to debunk these people. Now, I actually have spent my career and my life studying precious metals and understanding them and, and working with a range of clients to maximize their profitability and their wealth based on precious metals. And for these people to come in and trash the house where I live is offensive to me. But the reasons, the reasons why I have actually stood up against these guys are twofold. 
The first time I did this was the late 1980s when Ted Butler, who had been a white shoe broker for Drexel, who got caught doing inappropriate things in the frozen and concentrated orange juice market before the movie Trading Places came out, I should add. And uh, he started these theories that there were, there were there was a conspiracy to suppress the silver price. And at first it was Drexel. And then Drexel went bust, so it was Merrill. And then Merrill got out of the precious metals business, and so it was J.P. Morgan. But in the late 80s, when he first started sending letters to like Attorney General Thornburg, in the United States and the governor of Idaho and, and mining executives, a lot of the mining companies use CPM Group as advisors. So the, the CEO gets a letter, there's a conspiracy to determine, the, to, to suppress the silver price. He gives it to the PR people and says, you know, we have to draft a response to this letter because they're starting a shareholder rebellion. We should be spending all of our money and time fighting the banks that are suppressing the silver price. We need to draft a response as to why we don't do that. And the, the PR people in the in mining company go to the treasury and say, do you know anything about this? And they say, well, what we do know is that we use CPM group for our market research and analysis, and they can help you draft this response. So in the late 80s, we started drafting responses for various silver mining companies that were getting this thing. And part of that response and part of our services was we put together, you know, lectures and reports that said, these are the conspiracy theories. These are the things that suggest that these conspiracy theories are bogus. And this is the evidence that suggests that there isn't a conspiracy out there. So we were doing a lot of educational work for mining companies and industry associations and others, as well as drafting letters that the CEOs could send. That was the late 80s, and then everything sort of quieted down. And then in the late 90s, GATA started on the gold side, and they started sending letters to gold executives, and the gold executives started asking us, you know, help us draft a response. And it was really cute because, as you said, a lot of people don't, they, they'll, they'll just not even respond to this stuff, including the U.S. Treasury. But in that situation, GATA was challenging a couple people who hold themselves out as being gold experts to a public debate. And the guys wouldn't even respond to say no. But Anglo Gold, at the time it was just Anglo Gold, not Anglo Gold with Shanty. Anglo Gold said, we will sponsor, we'll pay for an internet-based global debate with GATA. And GATA said, great. They said, but we want to use Jeff Christian. And they said, no, we won't debate Jeff Christian. And they went away. That was like 2000, 2001. And so they stopped asking for a debate because Anglo Gold said, no, come on, you know, debate Jeff Christian if you're so certain. And they never did that. In 2009, then, GATA came out with an advertisement. They said, we want to challenge Jeff Christian to a debate. And here are six points that we would dare him to refute. And I didn't know about it because I don't pay attention to him. I'm doing my work in the real gold market. And an artist contacted me and said, did you know that GAD is using your name in these advertising, trying to raise money that they say they're going to debate you? And I said, no, I didn't know that, but bring them on. Well, they never, they, they went away. Bernard Lowe was a reporter at one of the networks at the time. And GATA said something to him about it. And he said, okay, We'll organize the debate. And, and then GATA sort of just disappeared. The following year, it was uh, March of 2010, there were hearings in Washington on the CFTC. CFTC was proposing imposing position limits on precious metals and energy, and they had hearings. And I, I actually was one of the people who testified. And, I, you know, among other things, I pointed out that the CFTC was had the authority to impose position limits already, and we didn't understand why they were holding hearings. And another thing was that the proposed position limits that they were talking about imposing were higher than the ones imposed by the exchanges, so they would be meaningless. And again, you know, that just sort of begs the question, why is the CFTC doing this? At the same hearings, GATA came out with this guy named Andrew McGuire, who at the end of the day, he held himself out as being somebody who had traded gold at J. Aaron and he knew how the conspiracy worked. At the end of the day, he was actually an auto leasing agent, originally from England and then he moved to Vancouver, never actually traded metals at any bank. 
but he was this sort of Walter Mitty guy, and he made the mistake of of coming public in GATA, which is in the business, the cottage industry of gold conspiracies, grabbed him and kept him in the public eye. And so these guys were going around, and they were actually financed by someone who was creating gold and silver ETFs of his own and saying to the world through a variety of people that he was paying, listen, there's no gold at Scotiabank. There's no gold at Fidelitrade, Delaware Depository, HSBC. You can't trust these big banks. You should trust me and you should take your money out of precious metals at these big banks and put it in my closed end ETFs where you're going to be paying a 25% premium for the gold and silver. And so those guys started this this campaign for people to pull money out of depositories. And a number of my clients happened to run depositories. And they said, you know, GATA had said they wanted to debate you a year ago. GATA is causing us great pain and agony now because we have all these clients saying, is there really gold there? And we say, yes. So please debate them. And I said, you guys arrange the debate. I will. So we had a debate in... May of 2010 on radio. Then we had another physical debate, maybe two. We had another you know, one that was video broadcast in 2011, I believe, and then again in 2012, which is when uh, the guy tried to choke me. But I was laughing too hard, so he couldn't get away with it. Anyway, so it's not that I go out of my way, but I have had clients, gold mining companies, silver mining companies, big banks who have said, Jeff, these guys are really causing problems in the market. Will you please debate them? And I have. And, you know, I feel bad about it because it's like debating somebody who's really, really, really young and naive and doesn't know what they're talking about. You know, I'd, I'd love to have a debate with somebody serious, but serious, intelligent, well-informed, knowledgeable people don't believe these conspiracies. For the benefit of any listeners who may not be familiar with GATA, which Jeff has mentioned several times, uh, I call them the Gold Anti-Truth Alliance. Uh, I believe it actually stands for Gold Antitrust Action Committee. It is a group of activists who allege that there is widespread market manipulation, conspiracies to suppress the price of gold and so forth, and uh, they're trying to do something about it. Jeff, one of the things that really struck me in the hearing that you mentioned with the CFTC, one of the things that you mentioned in passing was that the ratio of cash settled transactions to physically delivered transactions on the LBMA is uh, about 100 to 1. And that led to GATA and also Andrew McGuire just going, you know, absolutely ape crazy with, they called it the shocking admission the shocking admission of Jeffrey Christian, that there's 100 to 1 leverage on the LBMA, which means the entire system. I remember one podcast where Andrew McGuire did a beautiful job of theatrics of saying leverage works in both ways. It can unravel the entire system. You later went on to politely explain that leverage has nothing to do with the ratio of cash settled to physically settled transactions. And even after you explained that, which in the eyes of anybody who actually understands how the market works, just was really embarrassing to Gata and to Andrew McGuire, because it evidenced that these guys are in way over their heads and they completely lack an understanding of the most basic mechanics of how the market works and of the most basic concepts in finance, such as what is leverage. Even after you did that, for about 10 years, they continue to push the shocking admission of Jeffrey Christian, who admits that there's 100 to 1 leverage. So what's going on here? Do these guys really not understand the difference between leverage and the ratio of cash to physically settled transactions, which obviously has nothing to do with leverage? Or is it a matter of, yeah, they do understand it, but they know that this is a, a soundbite that seems to resonate well, and they keep selling it because people keep buying it? I think it's the latter. Also, you know, uh, I make it a point that when I make a mistake, I, I say, hey, I made a mistake. But a lot of people who feel feel like they can't do that. And, uh, you know, I think having said something that's cataclysmically embarrassing, that basically says, I really don't know what I'm talking about. 
you can't really deny that. And, you know, thinking about some other people in the gold market, some people talk about how forward sales involve borrowing spot gold and selling it in the spot market. And then unwinding it involves buying spot gold and, and, and delivering it to unwind the, those forward sales, which is nonsense. But having said that for 25 years, your reputation is destroyed if you come along and say, gee, for 25 years, I've knowingly misrepresented the market. You know, and I, I think that that's part of it that is going on there. And, you know, it's a cottage industry for these guys. They, they, this is what they do for a living because they can't be brokers and they can't lease cars anymore, I guess. So they have to continue the, the charade regardless of the reality around it. I want to come to the specific misconception that uh, seems to have upset some of my listeners when I quickly explained it. There is right now, because we have a, a crisis going on in the world, there's a lot of demand for retail gold products. That creates a price differential, a premium. If you look at the price of gold as it's quoted on the spot market by looking at a financial chart, or if you buy gold through a paper product like an ETF, there's a price for that. But the price to buy gold coins or retail-sized gold bars is about $200 higher right now. Now, there's a good reason for that. It's a very simple reason, which I'll ask you to explain in just a moment. But first, I want to introduce the alternative reality version of this. The explanation that is favored by some of those convicted felons that work in the physical metals market is the reason is because the long-awaited breakdown is occurring. The physical market is decoupling from the paper market. The paper market is going to crash to zero because it's all based on paper promises that don't mean anything. And that's the reason we're seeing this differential, Jeff. And you better hurry right now, this instant, buy physical coins and buy them for me for $250 above the spot price, because we're seeing the beginning of the breakdown, of the great crash, of the paper market losing connection to the actual physical price of gold. Jeff, debunk that nonsense for us and explain the real reason that retail physical gold costs more than wholesale physical gold right now. Well, first, let's start with the thing. You know, the gold boys have been saying that this is going to collapse imminently since 1999. The silver people, it goes back to like 1987 or so that they've been saying this, and it just hasn't happened, you know. But there's a whole bunch of things that happen in the financial markets for precious metals, as in other financial markets, that are just completely ignored. One is the difference between wholesale and retail. And back in 2010, when these guys came after me, and there was a big discussion, and if you recall, in 2010, 2011, the gold price was rising to record levels, as was the silver price, and you had very tight markets for physical metal, because you had Investors buying like 40, 44 million ounces of physical gold and, and more than 200 million ounces of silver, more than ever before in history in a given year. And that created a tightness for silver coins, gold coins, small bars, small medallions, investor sized products. These are retail products as opposed to the wholesale 400 ounce bars traded in London or the wholesale 100 ounce bars or 100 ounce contracts traded on the on the COMEX market. And at that time, we actually said, well, if you look at the price of a can of cocoa in the grocery store, and you say, well, this is the price, what's the wholesale price based on this? It was like $6,500 a ton for cocoa, when the cocoa price actually was about $2,000 a ton. You know, so there's a differential between wholesale prices and retail prices. There's a differential between metal that's held on an unallocated account or is registered against the COMEX on a wholesale size and a small size. So that's one of the issues. Another issue is that planes aren't flying right now. You know, the world is completely shut down. Most gold and silver moves by plane because of the value being very high relative to the weight and uh, people want that stuff. You have mining companies closed around the world. You have refineries closed around the world. You have mints closed around the world. 
or cut back to, you know, half schedules or even less, uh, one third schedules. So you have tightness in the markets. But even if you could make those coins, you're having troubles flying them. Now, silver coins in the United States actually travel by truck, but gold coins tend to travel by plane. And the planes that would ship metal from London to New York or wherever aren't flying. So you have logistical issues there, too. And you also have in some states uh, coin shops being declared non-essential enterprises and being told to be closed. So you have a distribution disruption that's not only in gold, it's also in vegetables, fruit, newspapers, and everything else that's causing these disruptions. You have other issues that these guys tend to overlook that you alluded to. Yeah, London is an over-the-counter market. There, you know, People talk about the trading on the LBMA. There's no trading on the LBMA because the LBMA is an industry association representing banks in London that trade bullion. There is an over-the-counter principal-to-principal market that trades through London and actually around the world too. And the problem with principal-to-principal is credit. So you saw this in 2008, 9, 10, 11, and you're seeing it again right now. With the credit crunch going right now, and you know the TED spreads off the charts, the uh, spread between corporate paper and, and treasuries is off the charts. With the credit crunch that's going on right now, a lot of people don't have the capacity to trade in the over-the-counter market, but they are trading in some cases. One of the big trades, and it's been going on for several years now, investors have been selling gold and silver. When they sell gold and silver, they sell it in the spot market, and it gets delivered into London. And the banks that are buying it, because they're market makers, they stand to buy or sell, regardless of what their clients and counterparts want. So the banks have been buying this stuff, and um, they have to pay 100% because it's spot physical metal. They have to pay the sellers that. Now, in March, when the crisis really hit, you had a massive amount of gold and silver, but mostly gold by dollar value, being sold into London. So the London market was kind of depressed. If I'm a market maker and I'm buying this stuff, okay, first thing, staying with with all of the mechanics, because it's a complex story. If you can't, lay it off in the -the over-the-counter market, you have to hedge your purchases somewhere. If you're a bank, you're probably being financed by your own credit department. If you're a non-bank, you're probably being financed by a bank. And the terms and conditions of those financial arrangements are, I will give you the money you need to buy to trade precious metals as a bullion dealer or a bullion bank, but you have to be 100% hedged, right? So, I have to hedge this stuff. I have all this gold flowing into London that is being sold to me. I have to hedge that exposure. I can't really hedge it in the OTC market because A, the credit's not there and B, people don't want it anyway. So I turn to the COMEX where they have a clearing house and the credit is open and I short my, I, I go short the COMEX as a hedge against my long fiscal position. I'm not doing that because I want to drive the price down. I'm doing it because I have to hedge my long position. So I'm long gold in London and I'm short gold on the COMEX. Now, if you go back to the beginning of March when all of the COVID-19 inspired craziness started, April is an active futures contract on COMEX. No one trades March because it's not really an active month. So I'm buying spot in March, and I'm selling April contracts on the COMEX. At the beginning of March, you had 51 million ounces of open interest on the COMEX. And this is another thing that these guys always distort. That open interest is matched. For every ounce sold, there's an ounce bought. So 51 ounces of sales and 51 ounces of of purchase commitments for April. Over the course of March, the standard practice across commodity markets is to roll out of the nearby active month before its first delivery date. So over the course of March, the open interest in the April contract on COMEX 
went from 51 million ounces to 400,000 ounces. As those banks and brokers and others who were short gold, and some of them were investors, there was actually a very high level of investors who were shorting gold because they thought it was too high. Those people say, I don't want to deliver into April, so I've got to get out. I can deliver physical metal, but I don't want to deliver. I can buy back my contract and capitalize my losses if I have losses. Or what most of them do is I will buy back my April contracts and I will sell June. So as March progressed, you saw April open interest go from 51 million ounces to 400,000 ounces. And you saw the June contract go from like 12 million ounces to 39 million ounces as those people were rolling. And you have this confluence of events. One is in the physical spot market in London, investors are selling and the banks have to cover those positions. Second thing is you have the April roll going on over the course of March on the COMEX. So that has the tendency to push up the April contract because these guys are buying back 51 million ounces of gold. And it also has the contract, it spreads the backwardation because it, it depresses the June contract that they're selling. So all of a sudden you have April COMEX rising and you have London gold falling. Because one of the things the banks have to do when they hedge is they have to assure themselves and the sources of their financing that the hedge that they have covers their costs. So if I'm buying gold and I think I can sell it next week to somebody else, I have to cover the carry for a month or or for a week. But if I'm buying gold and the world looks pretty bad for the next six to 12 months, I'm probably going to be holding this stuff on my books a long time. My interest rates have shot up. I have to cover that cost for, let's say, six months or 12 months. So you have this widening of the spread where you have this depressed London market while you have a very high COMEX. And so you got up to like a $70 spread at one point, and you know, then it closed up as things got resolved. So you know, that's one of the things. Now, in reality, COMEX gold inventories have been rising. They're over 10 million ounces today. They're not at record levels because the record levels were reached in 2010, 2011. London stocks are something like 260 million ounces right now. That's a record amount of gold stored in London. Switzerland has record amounts of gold. So there's plenty of gold around, not only in London and Switzerland, but also in New York and other places. So it's not a matter of there being an absence of, of physical metal. And it's not a matter of this thing having to collapse in order to think, you know, things don't have to be resolved by fire. You know, I I was raised Catholic, so I I understand that there are any number of people who think that the only way to resolve things is by fire. But the reality is that you can work your way out of things. And there's a certain mechanism here that goes on every three months anyway. It went on in steroids in March. Okay, we covered a heck of a lot of ground there. I just want to come back to my original question and summarize that part for for anyone who who may have lost track with all the extra information that we covered. With respect to why does a a gold coin cost $200 an ounce more than the paper price? It's not because the paper price is decoupling from the physical price. It's because there's a premium in the retail physical price price over the wholesale physical price. So the wholesale physical price of gold and what's being traded on the futures market are basically the same. The difference is called basis and it's minuscule. But the big premium is the difference between the wholesale price of physical metal and the retail price of physical metal. It's simply because refineries, as you say, are either shut down or unable to ship their products. Of course, there is a big premium there. Can I add... You know, because I oversimplified there. I mean, as complex as my discussion was, there's another factor here. I mentioned earlier that for the last two years, investors have been buying historically low amounts of gold and silver. That has really put big strains financially on the wholesalers and retailers of coins. And these guys have been under severe financial strain for a couple of years because their industry is selling 10% as many gold and silver coins as they were four years ago, right? 
Then the gold and silver prices start rising. Again, they live off of bank loans and revolving credit lines and credit cards. And all of a sudden, they don't have the credit to buy inventory. And just on top of all of this, there's this gigantic surge for their product. So there's also a financial constraint on the system, which has been damaged by the bear market and precious metals. I didn't mean to interrupt it. You know, I, I, I think people need to know, understand that's another fact. There are all kinds of factors that are behind this premium for physical small coins. That's another one. Well, Jeff, I responded in a recent podcast episode by committing the cardinal sin in the world of uh, the gold bug charlatans, which is I said, look, if you want to buy coins for approximately the current paper price, it's really easy to do. All you do is you buy the GLD ETF at the current paper price, and then you wait until we get through this coronavirus crisis and the big premium of retail coins over spot market comes back down to a tolerable level. At that point, you sell your GLD and you buy coins at a reasonable markup. That led to an overwhelming onslaught of emails and tweets, people saying, and I know you've heard this one before, Jeff, don't buy GLD. That's bad advice because GLD doesn't own any physical gold. It's just a paper gold product. There's nothing there but derivatives that don't really have any value. Instead, the better advice, according to these people who've been brainwashed by GATA and everyone else, is instead, I should have said, buy PHYS, the Sprott Physical Gold Trust, because that way you're actually getting physical metal behind your purchase. Um, there's so much nonsense in that. And, and, you know, these are smart people, and they're just smart people that have been misled by charlatans. But let's start with GLD. The GLD ETF doesn't own any physical gold. Is there any truth to that? No, there's no truth to that. There are some gold ETFs that are not physically backed, but they're the vast majority. Well, we, we follow, I don't know how many ETFs around the world that have gold backing. And GLD is the largest one. And GLD has regular audits. And they actually, I think, post the bar numbers on a website someplace. So GLD actually has 100% backing, and there's just no truth to the idea that they're using derivatives instead of, of gold. Jeff, when I suggested that listeners simply buy GLD to lock in a price and hedge their exposure until such time as they could buy physical at a reasonable markup, a lot of the feedback we got is that's really bad because they, they think or people have told them that GLD doesn't own physical gold, which is nonsense. But what they suggested is, they said, Eric, you should have given them the much better advice that they should have bought not GLD, but PHYS. Now, Jeff, I think this has to be the most brilliant marketing innovation of our lifetimes. Somebody at Sprott had the presence of mind to say, look, we've got an entire investor community that has been diluted into this notion that GLD doesn't own any physical gold. So why don't we create a fund? that has a ticker symbol that makes it sound like our physical gold is somehow more physical than the other guy's physical gold. So we'll create a fund called PHYS. The ticker symbol just makes it sound inherently physical. In reality, the physical gold that's owned by PHYS is no more or less physical than the physical gold that's owned by GLT. But PHYS is a closed end fund. Jeff, explain the significance. Why is a closed-end fund maybe not such a good idea if in the transaction that I described where you'd be buying GLD to lock in a price until you can move into physical coins? Well, I think that you probably are better able to explain the limitations of closed-end funds than I am. I've always avoided all closed-end funds simply because they're closed-end. And you get these price distortions between them, their asset value, and the underlying asset value simply because there's a cap on them. So you have a contrived sharpness or limitation in a closed end fund that you don't have in the underlying asset fund. And so you can get these gigantic uh, 
disparities between the price of, of a closed-end gold fund and the underlying bullion price because you have this premium there for something that has a limit to its supply that doesn't match the limit to the underlying basic commodity. Exactly. And this is a point that I think is really important for our listeners to understand. A closed-end fund, because of its mechanics, it means that the fund can trade at a premium above the price of gold. Now, in the case of PHYS, it can't really trade, for very long at least, at any discount below the net asset value because it does have a redemption clause. And that means that if it ever did trade at a discount, somebody would buy those discounted shares and redeem them for physical metal. But it can trade and has traded it is at least a 25% premium. So you're paying much more for the PHYS paper gold product. PHYS is a paper gold product. It's a fund. It's not physical metal. But in the fact that it, it has a physical sounding ticker symbol doesn't change the fact that it is a paper gold product. You pay 25% premium in some cases above what the physical gold is worth that's owned by that fund because of the mechanics of a closed-end fund being traded at a premium over its net asset value. Whereas with GLD, where it's an ETF as opposed to a closed-end fund, it is reasonably efficiently linked to the actual price of gold. So it is just ridiculous that anybody thinks that PHYS is somehow better. Now, there is a legitimate argument here, and I think it's, uh, you know, in the interest of fair play, we need to tell both sides of the story. PHYS, because it's a closed-end fund managed by one financial institution, means that the counterparty risk, if the entire financial system were to collapse, who do you have to go after in order to get your share of the gold that's owned by PHYS? Well, it's Sprott, the, the people that run the PHYS fund, who are behind it. They're the ones who are in charge of physically securing the gold. You know who you got to go after. Now, the way ETFs work, and this is, uh, we, we can't get into all the mechanics of how an ETF functions, but it's necessary for an ETF to be an ETF that you allow market makers to create and destroy shares in order to keep the NAV linked directly to the share price. What that means for GLD is that there are several different participants in the market who are creating GLD shares, and that means there are several different custodians. So if you truly had the complete breakdown of the entire financial system, everything's in tatters, you know, the, the banking system doesn't exist anymore, and it's all being worked out by bankruptcy courts, there would be several different entities, different counterparties that you'd have to chase after as opposed to just one. Now, I could argue that either way. It's almost could be argued as a diversification of risk. And, you know, if you couldn't get a hold of Sprott to hold them accountable, at least with GLD, that risk is spread around and hopefully you'll be able to hold some of the counterparties accountable. But the only scenario where it would make any sense would be the complete and total collapse of the entire financial system, which is plausible, but I don't think it's about to happen tomorrow. And the crazy part, Jeff, is when this happens, when PHYS trades at a huge premium above what its gold is actually worth, what do they do? They write an article saying, you know why it's happening? Because it's the beginning of the end. It's the breakdown of the paper gold market no longer reflecting the physical gold market. It is just amazing how they dupe investors with unadulterated bullshit. And uh, I think it, it ought to be criminal, quite frankly. You know, I'll, I'll just say that you're right, but I wouldn't limit it to that one company. I mean, the gullibility and the fact that there are so many precious metals investors who base their behavior on beliefs that are not necessarily grounded in reality you know, that just opens up the precious metals investment markets for a lot of people to overcharge for materials. And, you know, for decades, I've had people say to me, well, you know, I, I would invest in gold, but when I buy gold, it costs 14% when you add all up all the costs. And, and you know, that's, that's a deep hole to be working your way out of. And I say, no, 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 no. You know, in normal times, they buy gold for three or four percent over the spot price as a retail investor buying a coin or buying a small bar, and and 
it's not that gold is too expensive for investors to buy. It's that you're being ripped off. <laughs> you need a different seller. And it, it's not just that one company. There are a lot of companies that have not only those kinds of things and they overcharge for a variety of reasons, but they also have all kinds of things that you don't necessarily pay attention to if you're buying metal that's stored in a certificate program someplace. And, you know, oh, yeah, it's very easy to sell. It's very easy to sell. But there are all of a sudden fees. And then if you say, well, I don't want to sell it. I just want my metal. Then there are even it, it, it's virtually impossible to get out at, at, at a profitable level. Well, in the interest of time, Jeff, uh, we're not going to be able to get to all of the popular myths and misconceptions on my list because I want to leave time to move on to the more substantive topic of intelligent ways to invest in both physical and paper gold and metal products. I'm just going to do a couple of quick summaries of some of the other misconceptions. One of them is that the futures market is a bad place because that's just a paper derivative and it's a piece of paper that has no promise. Look, the futures market is cash settled daily. It is true that it is a paper promise and therefore you could lose today's trading gains if there was a complete shutdown of the system. But every single day they cash settle that market. It's not the same as the over-counter derivatives that exist in the LBMA market. Uh, another popular misconception, which you already explained, but I want to make sure it's clear to listeners. The bullion banks have been net short historically that can only mean that they're trying to manipulate the price of gold down. That's just utter nonsense. Anyone who understands the business that bullion banks are in, they're long physical metal. They don't want to take market risk. They're long physical metal because they need to have it in order to sell it to their customers. So what they do is for every ounce of long physical metal they have, they go short in the futures market in order to completely hedge their market risk to zero. They are naturally net short almost all of the time because that offsets their physical holdings. That's to be expected. There is no conspiracy here. Uh, it, it, there's just so much nonsense in this market. It's, it's really sickening, Jeff. Uh, confiscation risk. Gold was confiscated according to the gold bugs in 1933, and it's going to happen again, so you better watch out. First of all, gold has never been confiscated. There was a order that required people holding physical gold to sell it to the government at the prevailing price of the time. But the reason that that occurred was because at the time we were on the gold standard. That means that in order to debase the entire currency, which is what they were trying to do, they had to eliminate private gold holdings. We're not on a gold standard anymore. To debase the dollar, they just announced unlimited quantitative easing, which they've just done. It wasn't necessary to take back any gold to do that. So all of this fascination with the government's going to confiscate the gold doesn't have any basis in reality that I'm aware of. I mean, first off, in 1933, when they called in the gold, our estimate is that perhaps 25 to 33 percent of the world's wealth was in gold. So gold was a very important part of the global financial system, which was four years into the Great Depression. And so people were hoarding gold because of the debasement of paper currencies, and it was limiting government's ability to engineer a recovery from the Great Depression. So today, the amount of gold that private investors hold is something on the order of 0.5% of financial wealth. So it's not important. You know, if you're going to try to engineer a recovery, you're not going to look at something that's worth 0.5%. You're going to look at something that's 33 or 25%, you know, or in the case of the dollar, you know, you probably have about 75% of the global private wealth, financial wealth in denominated in U.S. dollars. So that's where it is, you know. The other thing is, yeah, there was no confiscation. There was one guy who held himself out as a martyr and dared the treasury to arrest him, so they did. But no one went door to door, no one went through safety deposit boxes. And one of the really interesting things is that the treasury estimated there was about 56 million ounces of gold held by individual investors in the United States prior to the call-in. And in uh, March of, if I remember correctly, on the day that FDR was inaugurated, he closed the banks for a week. 
And he said, I will be calling in the gold. And when he reopened the banks a week later, there were these enormous lines outside the banks to redeposit the money they had taken out and the gold they had taken out of the banking system because they had faith in FDR. And in the month between the time when he said he was going to issue the declaration to call in the gold and when he actually issued that declaration like a month later, 40 million ounces were turned in voluntarily. Another 4 million ounces were turned in afterward. And in one of the funniest things I've ever seen in a Treasury Department footnote, they said, well, the other 12 million ounces of gold must have been lost. Yeah. No one loses an ounce of gold. It just wasn't turned in. But with the exception of the one guy who wanted to be a martyr, no one was prosecuted for not turning in the gold. Contrast that to prohibition a decade earlier, where these guys went door to door, breaking down doors, going into my grandmother's basement and taking her wine away. You know? So yeah, the idea of a confiscation is something that is, it's just the, the probability of something like that happening is so small. You know, you, you can think of a thousand other things that you should be worried about. I want to come very briefly to one last uh, current event because it does have a lot of people confused. Uh, the narrative goes like this. What's going on right now is the COMEX is panicking because there's not enough gold and they've changed their delivery specifications. So instead of the, the old rules where you were delivering a single COMEX gold contract is equal to 100 ounces of gold, they have what are known as COMEX bars. They're, they're bars of gold that are exactly 100 ounces that can be delivered against that contract. They've expanded the contract specifications to allow the use of LBMA good delivery bars, which are 400 ounces ounces, and, and they can actually vary from, I think there's a specification range of 380 to 420 or something like that. And I think kilo bars also. The, the way the gold bug conspiracy theory community reacts to this is, okay, it has to be a reflection of the fact that the COMEX is about to fail because there's not really any gold there. What's actually going on here, Jeff? Well, first off, as I said, you know, you've got more than 10 million ounces of gold as registered and eligible gold in, in COMEX depositories. And and the reason they did that, and, you know, I'll risk, I'd CME Group, which owns the COMEX, is a good client of ours, and we've been friends of theirs since the 80s. But we have been suggesting to them for a decade that they needed to modernize their precious metals delivery systems. I mean, Actually, we've been telling them to go to accept powder, sponge, platinum, and palladium on the NYMEX uh, since around 1999 or so, and they haven't done that yet. But one of the things for the last decade or so, we've been given the opening up of China, the growth of the Singapore market, activity in London, we have suggested to the COMEX for some years that they should move to accept depositories around the country and around the world for their gold contract. And they have resisted doing that for a bunch of logistical reasons and such. But now with the COVID-19 virus and the reactions of governments shutting down transportation between London and New York with the large open interest that you had on the April contract, the COMEX has sort of capitulated to the reality that there's 260 some odd uh, million ounces of gold in London that is perfectly acceptable as a uh, metal that can be delivered against the COMEX. And, and given the vol volatility and the uncertainty and the constraints caused by some of the various financial market developments over the course of March, the COMEX has just opened up and said, yeah, you can, if you have gold in London, that's perfectly good gold. It's good delivery London gold. That means it's probably good delivery COMEX gold. Yeah, you can deliver it against your COMEX positions. Jeff, you and I now have been lamenting for the better part of an hour about the, the charlatans and, and nutcases that exist primarily on the physical side 
of this market. But I don't want to leave our listeners feeling like gold is a bad idea, because I think you and I agree. Gold is the asset, uh, and precious metals generally are going to be the asset to own in the 2020s. Let's leave behind all of the charlatans and the, the crazy conspiracy theories and come back to what do you recommend for, if let's call it gold for grownups, if people want to invest, does it make sense to consider both physical delivery as well as paper products? And if so, what's the split there? How do you decide how much of each you want and how do you go about doing it? When we're working with an individual or institutional investor, the first thing we do is hey, what's, your, what's your investment profile? What's your investment risk? What's your risk reward ratio, uh, sensitivities? What do you want? And one of the things about gold and silver, which I really like, is that unlike other assets like stocks and bonds, gold and silver serve several purposes for investors. Now, some investors just want price exposure. They want to take advantage of rising prices or falling prices. And for them, ETFs, futures, options, and forwards make the most sense. When we're talking to, like, say, a wealthy individual investor as a client, what we do is we suggest a diversified precious metals portfolio within their broader diversified investment portfolio. And one of the things that we tell people right off is you have to understand you have wealth and gold is an excellent diversifier for the denomination of your wealth, some of your wealth, and you have a portfolio and your investment portfolio is a subset of your wealth. And gold has roles to play in both. So you should have some gold and silver as catastrophic insurance against a financial collapse or economic problems or a revolution or a war, you know, something like that, or against personal catastrophic problems. You should have some physical metal, but you should also have some of your precious metals exposure in ETFs and futures, we like options, but we understand options. And, and options can seem, uh, for the mathematically challenged, people don't necessarily like options, but I do like options. And we, we use them a lot in constructing investor positions for, for precious metals. So, you know, I think the fact that gold and silver serve several functions or fulfill several functions for investors means that they're that it only makes sense that you, you use some physical metal, but you also use some derivatives because the derivatives will give you the ability to more cost effectively take advantage of shorter term and intermediate term price movements, whereas the physical metal gives you that long term insurance policy that you want. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the physical side of this. I think the paper products like the ETF shares and so forth are pretty self-explanatory. Physical market, um, it's a really, really bad idea to take physical delivery personally and keep any significant wealth in your home because bad guys will come and kill you and your family in order to take your gold. So don't do that. But you know, the, the industry answer to this question seems to be, okay, bullion banks offer, uh, first, they, it's very important to understand bullion banks offer these unallocated bullion accounts, which frankly, that is a paper product. There, there's no real gold behind it. But they also offer allocated accounts where there really is gold bullion owned by you in your name, where you, you know the actual bar serial number of the gold that you own. The thing is, Jeff, if what you're hedging against is the breakdown of the financial system itself, uh, keeping your gold in a, a bullion bank, which is probably one of the big investment banks, doesn't feel like the right idea. So I believe that you guys work with private vaulting services. Is that true? And how do they fit into this equation? We work with private vaulting services, but more often we use them. So you know, we have any number of clients who have come to us over the years who had precious metals stored at banks or investment banks. And one of the things that we like to do is we like to move our clients' metal into private, non-bank, non-financial depositories. And there are a number of them around the world. And again, with each customer, we, we learn what their risks and what their, what their investment profile is. And for some, we'll suggest a place in Switzerland or two that we know. For other people, we'll suggest places uh, in other countries. And we'll help them wade through some of the issues that are involved in that. But we tend to prefer non-bank depositories 
over bank depositories. And for the benefit of our listeners, we don't have time to go deeper today on that topic. But I did do a separate interview with a guy named Bob Coleman, who runs a private vaulting service in Idaho. We'll put the link to that interview in the description of this podcast on our homepage at macrovoices.com. So you can find a link there to my interview with Bob. We talked for a whole hour about private vaulting and how it works and what some of the ups and downs are. Jeff, I can't thank you enough for another great interview, and I I just want to close on uh, the same point that we opened on. We spent all of this time talking about some of the shenanigans and nonsense that go on in this market, because I think it's important to educate people about where some of those shortcomings are. But at the end of the day, folks, gold and silver are just incredibly strategic investments. We didn't really spend a lot of time going into the reasons why, because we've covered that on the Macro Voices podcast elsewhere. But please don't come away from this interview thinking that we're down on this market. We're down on certain people and certain players and misconceptions that exist in this market. Jeff, for people who want to find out more about what you do at CPM Group, you advise institutions. It's funny, too. You know, I I hear this all the time. That Jeffrey Christensen ain't nothing but but an apologist for the bullion banks. Well, the first thing I, I, it blows me away is, why do they call you Jeffrey Christensen? I mean, your name is the same as the most popular religion around. Uh, it's just not that hard to get right. But they call you an apologist for the bullion banks. I think most of your business is actually advising people how not to get screwed over by bullion banks. So tell us a little bit about CPM Group. What do you do there? And what services do you offer that might be of interest to our listeners? Yeah, we, we offer a variety of services. We are a research consulting company. We are financially savvy. We understand how precious metals and other commodities trade around the world. And we help a range of companies. Basically, anybody with a large financial exposure to a commodity is a suitable customer for ours. We do have gold, silver, and platinum yearbooks, which are $160 ebooks that you can go onto our website cpmgroup.com and you can order those ebooks for $160 each and those are really good primers for people who want to understand the the basic markets then we have more detailed work and you know we do research we sell research reports that are regularly scheduled we sell special research reports most of our business is consulting and it's helping investors maximize their exposure and optimize their exposure to precious metals or other commodities. We work with institutional investors, high net worth individuals. We work with brokers that service smaller investors. We have a number of of brokerage houses and such that we work with uh, that provide retail business around the world. We have asset management where people will say, this is all too complex for me, you know, Can I give CPM Group money either in a managed account or some sort of fund to manage for us? We do hedging strategies for producers and consumers and refiners and processors of commodities. And we, as we do our research, we see interesting investments and we see other investments that we say, no, you should avoid those. So we we advise our investor clients on the best ways to, as I said, optimize their exposure to precious metals. Well, Jeff, we only got to half of the conspiracy theories and uh, misconceptions on my list as far as debunking them, but hopefully we took a dent out of it. We're going to have to leave it there in the interest of time. For the Macro Voices Podcast Network, I'm Eric Townsend. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Please register your free account at macrovoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. 
Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices.